Hey everyone, Mr. Happy here, and welcome back to my Final Fantasy XIV job retrospective series. To celebrate 10 years of A Realm Reborn service, I'm taking a look back at the history of all the different jobs and their job updates, at least the ones old enough to really look back at in the first place. We're seeing how they were back in A Realm Reborn, checking out expansion to expansion until we finally get to the current day, which we don't need to look at too much. You can see that in the game yourself. Now, last episode, I shifted my attention to do one on Paladin since the rework was imminent, but now I'm going back to what my original plan was for that week in that of Summoner. Of all the jobs I've been dreading doing, this one is, well, one I've been dreading and looking forward to. It's had a lot of gameplay and identity shifts over the years, including into Endwalker itself. So time to see why this job has had such a tumultuous experience going from patch to patch, expansion to expansion, day to day. Now, in order to do that, we're going to need a way of looking back at the skills, how they were in A Realm Reborn and so on. So to do that, I use the Wayback Machine. Now, this tool is normally used to combat misinformation since it allows you to look at archived versions of sites. However, I'm using this to tell you about how Summoner was several years ago. So, you know, potato, potato. But if you want to check it out, it's in the description of the video. All right, so first and foremost, we can't just look at the summoner pages because of the way that the information was kind of done in the olden days. Uh, the base class Arcanist has some of the skills and then summoner has the job specific skills. We're specifically using the Wayback Machine to look at the console games wiki, which I was glad had this kind of information in the first place. So we're gonna start with Arcanist. We're gonna go to summoner and we'll take a look at the various patches to and from. <laughs> it's gonna be so many, so many things to look at. So first off with Arcanist, you'll see a lot of stuff that should still be familiar to this day. You see Ruin, you see Bio, you see Summon, you see Physic, although you're probably wondering why that's even still there all these years later. At least back then, there was less division between classes and jobs. So Summoner being the only job to branch off of a class, well, one of only two, the other one being Scholar, they both came off the base class of Arcanist, so the skill overlap was much more egregious back then. It led to a lot of balancing issues, and it's why they are more separated now, even if they're still connected at the base by the Arcanist class. Energy Drain, oh boy, Scholars probably get more uh, PTSD looking at Energy Drain than Summoners do, although, you know, it has changed significantly over the years for both of those jobs. Miasma, Virus, Virus was an interesting one. Uh, you may have remembered me mentioning this in one of the other videos, but essentially it's what Adel was. It's what Adel is now, but specifically it was for physical damage reduction. So now it's, you know, nowadays it's casters can reduce magic damage and melees can reduce physical damage. Back then it was the casters reducing the strength and dexterity. Now if memory serves, we do get a trait that expands that to intelligence and mind as well. And it made it a very, very, very powerful tool. So much so that they had to give it an antivirus debuff uh, after it was applied so nobody else could rapidly apply it right after. Then you have Summon 2. Now, uh, interesting thing, if you started playing Summoner in Endwalker, you may notice that there's Summon and Summon 2. Uh, that's because back then and all the way up until Endwalker, your pet was at least a separate entity from the Summoner. It has its own pet hotbar, its own pet actions, and each of the different summons summoned a different style of pet. You can see under Summon, it says it was a caster type pet, and for Summon 2, it was a tank type pet. Just in time for you to save any sort of duty finder group where the tank just couldn't keep aggro for whatever reason. Also gets sustain a few levels later, which allows you to sacrifice your own health to help restore some of their health. And while that sounds great, it was, it needed a lot more use than it sounds. Like you might be thinking to yourself, oh, you know, yeah, if uh, I'm using the tank pet and it's tanking for me, of course I'd want to sustain its health. But pets back then, including scholar pets as well, could be hit by just generic boss AoEs, cleaves, all that stuff. So it was actually not too uncommon for people that like, uh, among like content guides, the summoner places their pet over there option so the pet could completely avoid all of the dangerous aoes and not die if your pet took a hit and survived you needed to use sustain in order to keep them alive and let's just say that many of people didn't notice their pet was gone until it was a little too late 
Resurrection is here as well. This is something they still have to this day. And then Bio 2. So you may have noticed that we have Bio, Miasma, and Bio 2. Uh, it, Summoner had a lot of dots. Dots were way more prevalent in the game in general back in A Realm Reborn. And that actually led to a number of issues with the limit to how many debuffs a target could have and also the limit of debuffs that a target could display. Now, if memory serves, and feel free to correct me, a, a target could display 24 total debuffs and could be affected by up to 72. Now, those numbers don't sound 100% right, but it's the display limit is not the total number of debuffs a target can have. So there were all sorts of issues with people's dots not properly moving to the front of the display list or it not being able to apply overall, whether that be in Fates or even 24-man raids like the Crystal Tower at the time. But that's this is a result having bio miasma and bio two. They were all three different buttons back then. And then you could spread them all with Bane as well. You could see Bio, Bio 2, and Miasma. You spread it to all the nearby targets. That was kind of the, the core gameplay element of Summoner for many, many years was your dot management. You wanted your dots rolling all the time, and if there were multiple targets, you wanted to spread them to other targets, and it was just this slow turn of damage on top of your pet basically being a mini damage over time sidekick, I suppose, and then your own damage. It was a lot of little numbers that just kind of added up to make a big overall output, though they struggled with the big part. They were considered underpowered in a lot of cases, and, and then they flipped the switch, and they end up being kind of overpowered in other situations, so it's kind of tough. Eye for an eye, I brought up in another video. This was an Arcanist-specific thing. I uh, erected a magic barrier around a single party member or pet for 30 seconds, and there was a 20% chance when the barrier was struck that the striker would deal 10 percent less damage for 20 seconds basically you were praying that anything that hit a target with eye for an eye would proc eye for an eye and then deal less damage for the next 20 seconds but you could not guarantee that would actually work and with a three minute cooldown and rng mitigation you can see why it's not in the game anymore ruin 2 being instant cast uh, actually ruin 2 was not instant cast back then i think yeah, ruin became ruin 2 at this point we didn't we didn't quite have it the way we have it now yet you know this is still something that is uh separate actually so no here's the only thing maybe we need to get into traits this is 80 potency and then this is 80 potency with uh the blind effect but i'm so oh no i'm sorry that's the cooldown not the cast time yeah so ruin 2 was instant still back then but you didn't want to use it because the mp cost was so much higher for the exact same potency and the blind didn't work on most things so it was still a movement tool back then rouse yeah we used to have a ton of ways of buffing your pet uh we're gonna see another one when we go into the summoner skill set as well but rouse Cure magic potency and damage dealt, so useful on both uh, Scholar and Summoner. While Rouse, the pet is immune to stun sleep, bind, heavy paralysis, and disease. I had forgotten about that little effect, but yeah, you buffed your pet every 90 seconds to make it either deal more damage or do more healing. It was an important part of, of just functioning. Uh, Miasma 2, another dot on top of the other three, but this one... AoE. It barely does any potency at all, only 10 potency for 15 seconds, but it does also apply disease, which reduces HP recovered by cure spells by 50% and inflicts a 40% heavy. Now that same effect is on Miasma, but this one being AoE, Miasma 2, uh, made for AoEing packs. But what you actually saw was something that uh, summoners did very frequently and we'll have to get to talking about role actions for the whole picture to make sense but you still use miasma 2 in single target at certain times so we'll talk about that shadow flare uh honestly a skill i still kind of missed you just put down an aoe that dealt damage over time and even slowed the attack speed of anything in it it just dealt damage like it was just a, a cool thing to have now for summoner it was fine but for scholar you couldn't have both Shadow Flare and, uh, and uh, Soil up at the same time. So you had to choose which one you wanted up at any given time. Now, here we go with the pet actions. You have Gust, Backdraft, Downburst, Shining Emerald. Uh, these are all the Arcanist ones, and Summoner just evolves them into, you know, Garuda, Titan, and then Summoner itself gets Ifrit as a Summoner exclusive, you know, pet action. But one of the big ones here is Shining Emerald, which would become Contagion when Arcanist becomes Summoner, uh, extends the duration of damage over time effects already cast by the Master by 15 seconds. So you would combine that with Bio, Bio 2, Miasma, in some cases Miasma 2. But more importantly, you had the roll action Thunder during patch 2.0 for A Realm Reborn, 
And you could also use an item called a potent poisoning potion, which is just a potion you applied to a boss that dealt barely any potency. It was very common for high-end groups to have everybody bring these potions and use them on cooldown for an extra like 50 potency per player. It doesn't seem like a lot, but I mean, all eight players use it, 50 potency a player, you know, using them a few times throughout the fight. It was, it was pretty nice, although uh, <laughs> I don't remember. I don't think we had damage potions back then. I'm trying to remember if we did, because if not, then uh, we were really committing to a weird choice here, in my opinion. But yeah, you would just stack all those dots and then extend them with Shining Emerald and then eventually Contagion. And other than that, it's all kind of simple stuff. You know, you have single target damage, you have an AoE, you have, a, you have single target damage with a knockback, which it could absolutely grief during casual content in dungeons. And then you had Downburst, which was AoE. Use it for AoE, AoE packs, whatever. And then you move over to Titan, which was, you know, Emerald Carbuncle at the low levels, which, you know, you still have in your Glam. You know, has an AoE for, uh, you know, just damage, has a single target enmity increase, has uh, a defensive cooldown, and then has a stun. Didn't have any AoE enmity increased abilities. This was just plain damage, which made them really bad in dungeon packs. They're good for holding one target with gouge, and calling them good would be a disservice. Now, going down to traits, of course, Ether Flow was a big thing. Um, back then, you started with just one stack and gradually worked your way up to three stacks at level 40. Um, the other things that you would have here would include pet actions, just having a chance of increasing your spell speed. Long cry from what we have today, where being outside of a certain range of skill speed or spell speed is generally considered to be a bad thing. Super virus, this made it so that it was intelligence and mind enfeeblements as well. So any clan, so summoner and scholar specifically had access to super virus, whereas the other classes would only have access to the regular virus, which was only going to work on physical damage stuff. Uh, then we also had eye for an eye cooldown down to two minutes and rouse down to 60 seconds. So as you can see, big focus on the damage over time, the pets, it's a lot of, again, little damage added up over time. Now, as we go over to summoner, we get to complete that picture a little bit more. Summon three summons a physical attacker type. It summons Ifrit, who was often not used. Again, pets were very susceptible to damage. So the melee ranged pet was considered kind of a no-no for a long period of time until they eventually fixed that fester which we have now but what it was up until end walker is it had like a really low potency unless you had dots applied so this actually had a zero potency unless you had at least one dot applied bio bio 2 and miasma capping the potency at 300 that was your go-to filler dps ability you didn't really want to have to use energy drain for mp you wanted to be able to just burn through festers and then eventually they would get other ether flow uses that were aoe or had other applications but in a realm were born this was the bread and butter try disaster uh just aoe damage it was just their regular kind of aoe spell to use only 30 potency but did apply a bind funny thing about that bind in some serious end game content you brought summoners just for things like try disaster and the movement speed slow on stuff like disease it was considered useful especially in particularly the second coil turn two more commonly referred to by the community as turn seven both of these tools were invaluable in both the normal and savage difficulties of that encounter and just a fun little trip down memory lane for that one spur basically rouse to uh every two minutes you can boost its physical and magical power by 40 percent for 20 seconds so yes during any burst window you did have you wanted to use spur you just use it on cooldown and then try to apply you know do as much damage as you could and then whenever it lined what well, you can make it line up with in kindle which is every was every five minutes it's just the pet signature attack which is listed below aerial blast 250 in an aoe to all enemies nearby earthen fury uh would put 200 to all nearby targets then put down a dot on the ground for 15 seconds and then inferno which is 200 potency to all enemies in a cone in front but then also dealt damage over time a potency of 20 for 15 15 seconds so you know you get an extra 100 potency out of it so you know ideal this was the easiest one to hit if you could land multiple targets you used efreet but most people didn't use efreet because he was dangerous to use so most of this kind of stuff went out of the way speaking of efreet he had a stun he had a basic attack he had uh, a radiant shield delivers an attack with a potency of 50 every time physical damage is suffered so that sounds cool and all but very few bosses used physical aoe's uh, that's still true to this day and Radiant Shield back then could only be applied to, I believe, the Summoner themselves. No, actually to Ifrit themselves, if I'm not mistaken. So 
it was very, it was okay when you were soloing, but otherwise it very rarely got any effective use. And then Flaming Crush was an AoE. So that was Summoner at launch. Now through the rest of A Realm Reborn, they got kind of some small tweaks and it's a mix of small and large tweaks. The biggest thing would eventually be if we go over to Summoner in patch 2.1, they got rid of the Thunder cross class action. So if we scroll down here, I could have, you could have seen Thunder, Surecast, Swiftcast, Raging Strikes, Hawkside, Quelling Strikes, and Arrow. They had access to both Thunder and Arrow. I had forgotten about Arrow until I scrolled down. Uh, but And you could extend all of them with Contagion, which, you know, just to show you the updated one, here you go, Contagion, same as the other one I showed you. Um, so you would take Thunder, Arrow, Raging Strikes, uh, and then <laughs> the funny part is, so I, I think Hawk's Eye is specifically Dexterity. I think that's what it was when we looked at it the other day and not just damage. Uh, so, you, yeah, you took... Oh, no, but you also couldn't miss... That was what it was. So Thunder, Arrow, Raging Strike, Swift Cast, and Quelling Strikes are pretty common just for that extension. But when we go over to patch 2.1 Summoner, uh, you can see both of the dots are gone because of that usage and the unintended effects of it. So then it became Raging Strike, Swift Cast, uh, Quelling Strikes. And then most people would take Sure Cast and then Blizzard 2. Blizzard 2 had some applicable uses as your go-to AoE, but you still very, very rarely used it. Fun story, um, there was a lot of bugs in the Twin Tanya encounter back in patch 2.0. And we had a black mage who could only, Twintania didn't load on his screen after a certain phase transition. So it was just invisible. They couldn't target it. They couldn't single target, do anything. Their only solution was to stand next to her and just spam Blizzard 2. <laughs> so in that fringe case, would have been pretty great to have. But other than that, you know, looking back at Arcanist, for example, I'd say the class remained largely the same. You know, you still see Physic, Aether Flow, Energy Drain. Like there's probably some small differences between the skills as they were then and the way they would eventually evolve. But you can still see, you know, pretty much everything to be, I guess, on on par with what you'd expect. Uh, I'm trying to think of, or see even if there's anything noticeably different. Even the potencies are pretty much the same here, which was, you know, only representing patch 2.1. But yeah, even the 15%, the potencies here, all seem to be largely the same. And then, of course, you know, you have Shining Emerald, and then eventually we move down into Summoner here. We can still see five minutes, two minutes, you know, Fester with the 10 seconds. You got to check. The thing is, you got to double check because we got so much information with Summoner to see if there's anything even remotely different happening. And so it's can't avoid the constant cross-referencing and, and, and all that stuff, but it doesn't look like 2.1. Brought too many changes other than the role action change. Now, I do want to take a quick look at the end of A Realm Reborn Arcanist just to, again, see if we can spot any noticeable differences. And right now, we're seeing mostly the same. There might be some cooldown differences somewhere. I'm just, I'm looking for something, anything that indicates the, I guess, what would be the future of the class with how chaotic and and just all over the place the job has been over the years uh bane's still there bio 2 still there you know all this stuff still the same level still the same potencies uh, again i'm not really uh seeing much of a difference and if there are then it's something really really minor that happened between the start of a realm reborn and the end of a realm reborn yeah even all these are pretty much identical to the way they were before and the cross class actions we don't care about because you didn't play classes you played jobs True for the most part, but not not entirely, I suppose. Either way, uh, that covers pretty much all the things for Summoner in a Realm Reborn. So with that, you know, with the PvP actions being added at the bottom here in addition to the PvE actions. So with that, we can now jump forward a little bit into the next phase of Summoner, which would be Heaven's Ward. All right, so once again, we got to start with Arcanist. Now, Heaven's Ward was a pretty interesting evolution of Summoner. One of the biggest complaints about Summoner, even to and through Heaven's Ward, was that you were you were a dot mage. You know, most people said it was more like a warlock than a summoner. When they imagined summoner, they imagined summons being the focus of all of your gameplay. And it really wasn't until Endwalker where that became the case. But we started seeing glimpses of it in Heaven's Ward bigger glimpses of it in Stormblood and then kind of just status quo in Shadowbringers before we got the Endwalker rework. So going into the Heaven's Ward abilities, again, not a whole lot really changed. As you can see, one of the bigger things that we have here is that Miasma had some of its effects split up, whereas there was the disease effect before, it now has the malady effect and the heavy effect as two different things instead of disease being 
all of these different things at once. So this actually created an another another problem. There were multiple status effects coming from Miasma and that that cap on the on the status effects that I mentioned earlier on enemies is still a problem and there's just so many and every time you see multiple summoners or arcanists it became another problem. And not to mention that, you know, if you had multiple summoners or whatnot, it's not like there were multiple of these debuffs up. So only one of you was ever really applying it at any given time. So there's all sorts of just weird, janky stuff at that early point. Uh, then we have, you know, Resurrection, still the same, Bio 2. Now we have a little bit more information about the uh, combined total potency. Uh, we also had Bane granting one stack of Ethereal Attunement. Uh, and bear in mind that uh, something I kind of forgot to mention going back to a Realm Reborn Arcanist is Bane, I, I mentioned Fester being kind of like the main thing that you used Aetherflow on. Uh, you do, you did want Aetherflow for, you could use Aetherflow if the target is under the effect of Aetherflow, 15% of Bio, Bio Tour, Miasma has a chance of resetting. I believe that's specifically referring to the summoner being under the effect of Aetherflow. So Bane could be used on it as well, which, you know, in AoEs was fine, but the 15% chance of, of extending it wasn't really that big of a deal. It was nice when it happened, but you didn't really care that much. But now it's just, you know, it just uses Aetherflow, grants one stack of, of Aether Trail Attunement, and that'll make sense when we go over to Summoner. Eye for an Eye is still here. We have Ruin 2 still being identical. Rao is still being similar as well. Miasma 2 having the Malady and Heavy effect separately. The Shadow Flare still being here as well. And then you have Shining Emerald, Downburst, all the stuff that we went over before. Again, pretty much identical down to the way the traits actually worked. When we go into Summoner is where we start to see a different tale. Now we can tell this website's kind of old because it's not showing us all the PNGs for some of these skills, but you'll just have to use your imagination, I suppose. Fester is still working pretty much the same, although it did also give you Aether Trail Attunement, which will make sense when we scroll down a little bit more. Tribine still the same function. Spur still pretty much the same function. And Kindle now only three minutes instead of the five minutes it was before. And I'm sure if I look through Arcanist, I might be able to find some sort of uh, cooldown changes as well. Although most of their stuff didn't really have, like, you know, eye for an eye is still once every three minutes. So I guess not really much changed in that regard. Uh, then we move on to their new skills. So Pain Flare was an AoE alternative to Fester. You know, if you were on multiple targets, you'd use Pain Flare instead of Fester. And then you didn't even have to worry about dots. You just wanted to make sure you dealt as much damage. Ruin 3, which was still separate from Ruins 1, and two deals unaspected damage with a potency of 120, but it had a steep MP cost at base, which is hilarious given that you got it at level 54, meaning you would, if you were a new player and you didn't understand its effective use, you might go ahead and spam it and just run out of mana in no time at all. It was very select situations where you ever used Ruin 3 outside of Dreadworm Trance, though they did definitely exist. Uh, Try Disaster, which replaced the name, in case you didn't notice, Try Bind is what Try Disaster was before, so they took the name off of that and changed it to this level 56 skill that instantly applied all of your dots at their highest durations, which meant you had three different dots, one 18 seconds, one 30 seconds, one 24 seconds, and this you could use once every minute. Uh, this was great for basically quickly getting into a fight at the start and then being able to quickly refresh every minute, or if you had multiple targets pop up or you wanted to quickly dot something and save it, very flexible tool, very powerful tool that only got more powerful as the expansions went on. It was a little bit weird to incorporate at first because we didn't have things that extended the durations past, you know, something like Contagion, or uh, we, we only had it every so often. So you still had to manually cast dots between try disasters, which, you know, always led to some kind of weirdness, but that didn't mean it wasn't a useful tool. It absolutely was, especially if you were trying to kill a target in like 15 to 20 seconds. And as a summoner without dots, you can't really burst that target. So it just gave you that extra flexibility to fix some of the problems it had before.
Dreadworm Trance, however, was their new major tool. Uh, increased magic damage by 10% while lowering the MP cost of Ruin 3. Basically, Ruin 3 became your filler during Dreadworm Trance. Can only be executed when Ether Trail Attunement stack is 3 or larger. Ether Trail Attunement is achieved upon using Aetherful actions this last 15 seconds. So this was a personal buff. You could use it anytime you had 3 uh, Ether Trail Attunement, which you got from spending your Ether Float. You got 3 Ether Float. You got 3 Attunement. You could use Dreadworm Trance. But the big thing is, is because it increased magic damage by 10%, you kind of wanted to be in Dreadworm Trance while using some of the skills that you had outside of Dreadworm Trance, meaning you had to kind of time it in such a way where you ether flowed after, you know, you ether flowed without spending your ether flow while in Dreadworm Trance. So you could use those actions while you were in Dreadworm Trance. So you could make use of the buff to its maximum. So it just meant that you kind of, the start of the fight kind of goes nowhere for you. You can spend immediately and go into Dreadworm Trance like as part of your opener, just try to get those festers out. But it honestly took so many GCDs to get into that it just didn't really make a whole lot of sense. I mean, Fester took 10 seconds to do. So your only other option would be to do Fester, Pain Flare, Bane, or Fester, Pain Flare, Fester, and then go into Dreadworm Trance after 10 seconds into the fight. Not the worst thing. You know, four GCDs was actually pretty common for Burst Windows. Five GCDs even more common for some jobs. So you could do that as well, but you could also just save it and try to use it at the one minutes, which was not as popular of a thing to do. But they had these things under consideration for Dreadworm Trance as a whole. Then you had Death Flare, which was this their big, Big blasty level 60 skill, basically Akmorn from Bahamut, but just called Death Flare. Just big damage in an AoE can only be executed on uh while in Dreadworm Trance. And more importantly, Dreadworm Trance fades upon execution. So you wanted Death Flare to be the very last thing you did under Dreadworm Trance. Most of the time, there were definitely cases where you did an instant death flare, but that would come into play more in Stormblood, and it'll make sense to you when we go into the Stormblood-related stuff. But now we had these extra dot tools. They were still super dot-centric. They had more damage, but Dreadworm Trance damage windows were the most important thing. You needed to capitalize on that bonus damage. You needed to make sure you applied dots in Dreadworm Trance, usually via Tri-Disaster. And so, yeah, you just had this constant uh, balancing act of getting the Dreadworm Trance, using Dreadworm Trance, and getting to it again. Not too much different from what we have now in terms of kind of gameplay flow, but it was very different from the way Summoner was right before that, even if all the Dots and Fester stuff was still largely the same. Going into the pet actions, otherwise everything is still the same here. You still have Contagion, which would not survive that much longer, but did survive through Heaven's Ward, I believe. And all these actions, which again are still largely identical to the way they were before. Still the same raw actions or cross-class actions as they were back then. Same PvP actions. And I believe I tried to pull up some stuff from later in Heaven's Ward, but for some reason the page displayed differently. So like this is how the, the I guess very briefly they tried out a different form of of keeping track of actions here. Like you have ruin at 180, and I think that was actually a change. No, yeah. So at some point they decided to make ruin, you know, two and a half times its strength, I suppose, because that is a very very high potency uh, that I did not remember being the case. Um, and then actually we're seeing some stuff here that might be from later interesting so what i did is i went to a heaven's word page and i clicked this and yet i've got some of the stuff that i don't remember being in heaven's word i could have sworn eggy assault was something that came in stormblood because then there's eggy assault too so i wonder if their page linking just got all messed up during the heaven's word section because of information we had publicly because going into the summoner section i mean it remains largely the same except that the uh I guess the icons actually work for this one. You know, damage dealt, MP cost of ruin three down, three minutes, two minutes, you know, tri bind, fester, all the stuff that we just talked about with more clarity and more uh, conciseness. So I have to wonder if this Arcanist page is pulling from Stormblood related stuff and that is uh, different. I guess when we get to the Stormblood page, we'll know because I was going to say 180 is sounds like a very Stormblood era potency. And yeah, Ivy, you want to know more about Summoner 2? Yeah, because then you have Energy Siphon here as well, which I didn't think they added in Heaven's Word. So you know what? I think we've covered the Heaven's Word Summoner pretty adequately, even with this kind of uh, kerfuffle from looking through the Wayback Machine into these older pages. But you get the idea, you know, more dot centric stuff. They started to lean into the whole big you know, big attacks that summoners do, but it's coming from the summoner themselves. They're still kind of like a glorified warlock from World of Warcraft, or at least that's the kind of rep they still have. 
So now, let's see how Stormblood starts to turn that around. And finally, we get to go into the job guide page that we got in Stormblood. So now we have official Final Fantasy XIV posted archived records of the skills and even the changes that came from Heaven's Word before. As you can see, you know, the potency went up from 80 to 100. It didn't go up to 180. But the big thing is those eggy actions. Yeah, the eggy assaults. I think actually is a Shadowbringers thing. So weird that the archived version of that page brought me to, I guess, Shadowbringers actions. Yeah, it shows you how much I played it in Shadowbringers that I didn't even recognize where Eggy Assaults were actually coming from. Uh, so here you have it at the start of Stormblood, and we can see some of the changes. You know, Ruin is now exclusive to Arcanist. There's no more cross-class actions at this point. There's only roll actions, so it's, you know, Arcanist, Scholar, and Summoner. Small potency buffed. Bio and Summon unchanged. Physic now exclusive to Arcanist, Summoner, and Scholar. No longer, again, a cross-class action. Ether flow MP restored reduced from 20% to 10%. That was a big problem for Scholars, if I remember correctly. Summoner, too, but Scholar, it was it was a big, big thing. Stacks of Ether flow granted now reduced by one for each stack of Ether flow attunement gained. Aetherflow can no longer be used when Dreadworm Trance is active. So they were trying to eliminate that gameplay loop of Dreadworm Trance for good reason. But, you know, that that's what I was talking to you about before of trying to make sure that you had Aetherflow during Dreadworm Trance itself. Uh, but stacks of Aetherflow granted now reduced by one for each stack of Aether, Aether Trail attunement gained. So I think that just means that if you had, yeah, it's, what it means is if you had Aether Trail, you couldn't get ether flow in its place but you would still get some you just wouldn't get all of it energy drain you got at level six instead of level eight at this point you know otherwise nothing major restores hp restores mp whatever i think scholar might have lost energy drain briefly at this point that might have been shadowbringers as well uh miasma the malady and heavy effects were both removed just a damage over time skill now but still there summon two, the same uh resurrection now acquired a few levels earlier bio two instant cast which was a nice little thing but you still had bio Miasma and Bio 2. Uh, at least I think, yeah, because it's no longer, it's not an upgrade yet. Bane, Potency, yeah, this is where they started giving everything fall off damage. 80% fall off for anything after the fourth enemy. Oof, 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 oof. That was kind of a tough one. Summon three, the same. Fester, recast time only five seconds, so you could put it into burst windows much more quickly. Um, however, the potency dealt for one effect increased from 100 to 150. For two effects, for 200 and 230. No longer gains potency for third effect. So maybe Bio 2 was an upgrade off Bio at this point. Yeah, I think it is. I think Bio... Oh, you know what? That's what it is. Bio was already instant cast before. Now Bio 2 is just an upgrade off of it and was still instant cast. It just doesn't make mention that it's just a flat upgrade off it anymore. So, okay, now it's now it's all coming together because now you only had two dots in Stormblood. Ruin 2, uh, still pretty much your I need to move button. Potency increased to 100 and the blind effect was removed. Strictly a uh, movement tool at this point. Tribind unchanged, rouse, uh, immunity to, for two effects, paralysis and disease was removed because the pet couldn't be targeted any. Well, no, the, the pet could still be hit by some of these things, but I guess they just decided that disease was gone because they removed it from pretty much everything in the game at that point. And paralysis, I guess they just didn't want it to be immune to that for whatever reason, because it's not like paralysis couldn't happen still at that point. Still happens to this day. Shadow Flare, uh, now an off global cooldown ability instead of a casted ability like it was before. It's now instant, but it has a 60 second cooldown. So yeah, you just put down your Shadow Flare once a minute during buffs. And uh, yeah, and it ticked over 15 seconds. It also didn't have an MP cost, which was really nice as well. And Kindle, unchanged, still three minutes even. Pain Flare, a uh, five second recast reduction like Fester. Ruin 3, the potency reduced to 150. Uh, I think that was to stop people from trying to use it as much outside of Dreadworm Trance, but I don't remember that for certain. Try Disaster, uh, inflicts target with Ruin Nation, increasing potency of Ruin spells used against the target by 20% was added so it inflicts the target with bio 3 and miasma 3 your two fully upgraded dots when you were at max level but more importantly your ruin spells did more damage during tri disaster so you really wanted to make sure you capitalize on as many ruin casts as possible during that time especially during dreadworm trance where you have the mp cost reduction in ruin 3. if i recall correctly uh talking about how people would use ruin 3 outside of Dreadworm Trance before, I think Stormblood made it a lot more popular because you had Ruination to dig into that extra potency. So if I'm remembering correctly, that's how it ended up working. 
Now, Dreadworm Trance, only a 20-second recast now, but more importantly, the effects were completely revamped. You still had the magic damage reduction, or still had the magic damage, you still had the MP reduction, but it now reset the Tri-Disaster recast timer every time you used it, which was nutso. Uh, now, you still needed the Ether Trail attunement in order to use it, um, but uh, man, just getting that reset meant you could just chain Tri-Disaster. I think you had to hard cast like one set of dots every, not even every minute at this point. I think you maybe had to do it every other minutes, like once every two minutes. Um, it might've been once a minute as well, but you know, it's hard for me to remember every detail of these. But it also increased the trance gauge when it ended, and that's gonna deal with their level 70 skill. Other than that, you know, just it can only be executed when Aether Trail Attunement is at three, and Demi Bahamut is not summoned. Important note for later. It's, uh, and then it just explains how Aether Trail Attunement works. And then uh, cannot execute Aether Flow while under the effect of Dreadworm Trance, which they mentioned in the Aether Flow description earlier. Death Flare, recast time only 15 seconds now. Uh, potency reduced for falling off. So, you know, for every target it hit, it had damage fall off. It also still ended Dreadworm Trance. So it was just, it just had a shorter cooldown at this point. I think it was because you could fit two of them into Dreadworm Trance now. Dreadworm Trance lasted 20 seconds. I'm sorry, it lasted 16 seconds. Could you actually squeeze two of those in if you were fast enough? I don't remember if you could. I feel like there was a point where you could squeeze two Death Flares in, but that you know what though? You couldn't because it ends Dreadworm Trance still. So that's something that would come later. Probably a Shadowbringers change. Ruin 4 uh, can only be executed when under the effect of Further Ruin, which uh, we'll talk about in the traits further down, but that was something that was uh, very nice to have for some things. Uh, but yeah, Ruin 4 procs, uh, big, big deal. And we still have Ruin 4 now, but it worked a lot differently back then, the Further Ruin stacks and everything. Ether Pact, aka Devotion, increases attack, ma attack potency and healing magic potency of the closest party member. Oh man, I forgot about that. Oh... <laughs> So this ability automatically targeted the closest party member and so frequently it would be the wrong person. It reduced the damage they took as well, but that was such a frustrating version of Aether Pact. You'd have to tell your party members, be like, hey, Aether Pact's coming out. I want to give it to you. You need to stand over there. <laughs> oh no. Oh, I remember most people just didn't care. If they said, I'm pressing it, whoever gets it, gets it. I, I can't be asked to care. Bio 3, Miasma 3 upgraded versions. And then, of course, the big one, Summon Bahamut. Summons Demi Bahamut to fight by your side. Each time you use an action on a target, Demi Bahamut will execute Worm Wave on the same target. Lasted 20 seconds and at a Dreadworm Ether cost of two. Basically, every single Dreadworm trance you entered would give you one Dreadworm Ether. And so every two that you entered, you could use a Demi Bahamut afterwards. I think this is where you started seeing the quick Death Flares to do like a Dreadworm Trance into a Death Flare into a Summon Bahamut. But again, my memory is still a little shaky on it. Now, Worm Wave, as it says, it's basically Bahamut's auto attack, but it wasn't really an auto attack back then. Instead, it was every action that you used would execute a Worm Wave with a 1.5 second recast. So your goal was to basically pump out as many actions as humanly possible to make sure you got every Worm Wave imaginable. We had people using Addle, I think it was still, I think it was at this point under roll actions. People would just use Addle to trigger worm waves for damage instead of using it as a mitigation tool. So it was a very toxic tool and also, I believe, not very ping friendly in order to maximize it. And Kindle Bahamut would make him use Ochmorn, and this would just do a ton of damage, 680 potency on the first target, and can only be executed while Demi Bahamut is active. So you would just pop that in Kindle Bahamut there. And if I recall, this lasted 20 seconds, so you could use in Kindle Bahamut twice. Here we go. Now we got it figured out. Yeah, you could throw out two Ochmorns during that time. So it was a ton of damage. Now looking over into the uh, pet actions we have here. The biggest one to change was Shining Emerald, aka Contagion, which no longer extended the duration of dots. They started to normalize that at this point, and instead it just increased the target's magic damage taken by 10%. Now on the surface, that sounds really good, but one caster comps were very common, and even to this day still are. So the fact that it only increased magic damage meant it increased it for yourself and also for your healers. And then sometimes you may, you know, some of the tanks like Dark Knight has some magic damage and I think Paladin had maybe, I think they had Holy Spirit at this point, but generally speaking, it wasn't considered as useful because it was just 
ma target magic damage. So it was a bit of a contentious point for the balance of the job as a whole. Other than that, I think everything remains unchanged. It looks like Contagion also, you know, has its effect changed. And Radiant Shield increases the target's physical defense, physical damage taken by 2%. Wait, increases target's physical damage taken by... So wait, you took 2% more damage, but it did the, the counter attack? Why don't I remember that? Well, you know, that's fine. Well, now also deliver an attack when suffering magical damage. Yeah, so, but you could place this on somebody at this point, I believe. Hey, Ivy, I'm trying to record a video here. Look at this. Look, I'm in the middle of recording a video. Look at it. Hey, I'm giving you pets. Yeah, I hear you making noise over there. I've been petting you like the last, that's why I keep looking down over here because Ivy is over here just begging for attention. I'm trying to record a video right now. That being said, uh, yeah, increases targets damage taken. Wow, I don't remember it being damage taken. So weird. Uh, but I think you could cast it on other people at this point as well. So you could uh, actually use it offensively to a capacity. Roll actions, Adol, I just mentioned. It pretty much works the same as it does now, except it didn't affect physical damage back then like it does now. Break, you only use this if you were completely out of MP, just a spammable GCD damage that applied a heavy, or if you needed the heavy, of course, since that got removed from Miasma. Drain, you almost never used, so not much of a thing. Diversion, replace Calling Strike, so you know you use that pretty much on cooldown. Lucid Dreaming, reduced enmity by half, and the refresh. You'd use it for the refresh, but this really made enmity on summoners something very, very easy to deal with, or much easier than other jobs. Swift cast, I think that's a gimme. Mana shift, oh man. Yeah, the casters could give 20% of their own maximum MP to a target party member. And the thing is, you'd think Black Mage would be ideal for that, but Black Mages didn't want to do it because it forced them to mess up their mana calculations for their fire and ice phases. So it was actually very rare you saw a Black Mage even willing to use mana shift, so that responsibility fell onto Red Mage and Summoner. A pocket to stasis, it reduces a part... A party members magic vulnerability by 20 percent so it's just a targeted magic mitt fantastic for magical tank busters super powerful tool so we kind of missed that one sure cast you know next spell without interruption nullifies knockback and draw-ins the big thing is is if you casted a single spell sure cast would wear off so you needed to save it or if you needed to use it for knockback you needed to also stop casting for a second and a race to remove a single detrimental uh, or damage over time effect from a party member. It was okay. You know, it did have a cure potency attached to it, but it very rarely saw use. There was very rarely a place where you could specifically counter a damage over time effect in any meaningful content. So you just didn't see it used much. Ether Dam is now level 6 because Ether Flow is level 6. Uh, the, all the enhanced intelligence stuff is still here. It's acquired earlier. Corruption Mastery upgraded Bio to Bio 2. This is the expansion that started. Um, then we go down a little bit more. And pretty much everything else is the same, if not just some things are removed. Enhanced Pet Action, Super Virus, Energy Siphon, Enhanced Eye for an Eye, and Enhanced Rouse. All of that stuff gone. And it said you just have... A few other weird things in here. So the Ruin Mastery, the further Ruin procs from earlier, every time you cast Ruin or Ruin 3, there's a 15% chance that... Oh, I'm sorry. Every time the pet uses an action, there is a chance that Ruin or Ruin 3 would be upgraded to Ruin 4. In Shadowbringers, this would be changed further to make it something that was stackable. But this just meant that you had to, on the fly, be ready to react to a Ruin 4. And, you know, it was strong and you wanted it, but it meant that if you didn't get a lot of procs, you know, you were missing out on a lot of damage. Also, in Kindle, recast time uh, could re be reduced by 10 seconds every time that Ruin Mastery upgrades Ruin or Ruin 3 to Ruin 4. So that just meant that your in Kindle drifted from buff windows or you ended up having to hold it because it was just really strange. You either had to get enough to use it in an earlier buff window for somebody else or you had to hold it for your own or you just used it on cooldown and pretended it didn't exist for buffs. And that's what most people ended up doing. And then you have the Dreadworm Aether at the end of Dreadworm Trance. And other than that, I think we are all good. So as you can see, Summoner uh, took a better direction. This was much more Summoner-esque. This was super hype. A lot of people enjoyed it. It still came with a few gameplay quirks. It was very, very um, APM heavy. You know, you had so many buttons to press, especially to get into Bahamut, to utilize Bahamut to the maximum, you know, between your OGCDs and, and your and all the tools that you had. It was considered a very, very busy class. And it was overwhelming for a lot of people and continued to be a criticism throughout the rest of Stormblood. In fact, I believe I have some other pages here just to, I guess, check to see if anything else had changed at this point. And I can see Ivy is getting quite antsy being in my office. Let me let her out before I continue going through this section. There we go. 
cat problems, but hey, we love them. Uh, yeah, I don't think anything too drastic ended up changing at this point going into the, the rest of this stuff. You know, you still have the Ether Trail attunement. You still have all the, the upgrades. You still have, you know, I think the damage fall off on some things may have been adjusted, but I think that might have even been for other jobs and not Summoner itself. You still have Rouse on the 60 seconds. Tribind is here. Uh, Dreadworm Trance Effect. Ooh, I think that might be something that was new. Let me go back to Tribind in here. Yeah, so one thing they did do is Tribind was made to be their de facto AoE spam during Dreadworm Trance. So it would reduce the MP cost and remove the bind effect, but increase the potency to 70. So yeah, that was a change that they made at some point. Uh, and that ended up being really good for Dreadworm Trance. It was already so powerful with its AoE that that just kind of became icing on the cake on top of all of that. And we still have three minutes for that. We still have Pain Flare at five, Ruin three, uh, with a potency of 130 at this point. Uh, you know, I think that's down from 200 total. And I think, again, they were just trying to dissuade people from spamming it outside of Dreadworm Trance is why they just kept kind of bringing it down little by little by little to the point where it barely even felt like it was important to use at all. I mean, it was, but you know, still you had to, to weigh when you were using it and mostly just using it inside of Dreadworm Trance. But other than that, I think everything here is largely similar to what we were looking at before. All right, one thing I almost missed before going on to the Shadowbringer section, and apologies if I'm starting to go through this a little quick, but it's been a long day, and uh, this is a very long video to record. But Devotion did get a change before the end of Stormblood. Instead of being that closest target, by that closest party member thing, it was all party members, but they reduced the effect down to 2%. It also uh, increased healing magic of all the party members nearby by 5%. So it just became you know easily usable, not super beneficial, but not bad to have either at the same time so it gives you again a better idea of, of how summoner had kind of uh worked itself out at this point you know just uh just <laughs> constantly trying to be something new to build on top but i'd say at this point they're still building on top of what summoner was and we we haven't at the end walker point of it being entirely different. Now, Shadowbringers, on the other hand, though, does start to kind of lean in that direction, but it creates a whole different slew of problems that was not present in Stormblood, but also was completely removed in Endwalker. Now, going into Shadowbringers, since that is what the segue was supposed to accomplish, we have some pretty drastic changes to almost everything, and this would become... <laughs> quite the uh quite the talking point for summoners for the entirety of shadowbringer so first and foremost ruin got the fester effect ruin potency is increased to 130 for one effect or 180 for both yeah you wanted to make sure all of the ruins you were landing were with both of your dots up because otherwise it did less than half of the potency it's also that 180 potency that we saw earlier in that weird relink that i got from the console games wiki on the old heavens word page probably just some funkiness with uh, where the page currently leads plus trying to go there from like a fork it's, it's all sorts of weird stuff so that is, that's, I mean, that's a pretty major revision. It's been completely changed, as it says. Um, Bio was made 30 seconds and had its potency cut in half. So, you know, this is where they started making it. So you didn't have to apply dots as frequently, even right from the earlier levels. Physic is still Physic. Um, summon is still Summon, now categorized as an ability. So you didn't have to wait for the GCD to use it. You could use it as an OGCD. It was instant. And its recast time was made very little. Also, no MP cost. So if your pet died or you died, you could very quickly resummon whichever pet you wanted. Very solid change for the way Summoner worked at the time. Miasma, pretty much the same effect as Bio. You know, had its potency reduced to 20 and had its duration increased to 30. So again, they both went up at the same time. Then they got something brand new, Eggy Assault. Instead of having proper pet actions, instead they gave the summoner themselves an action that would initiate something from their pet. It still lagged a decent bit, like you would initiate an Eggy Assault and it would still take a second or so for your summon to actually react to the Eggy Assault going off. But it would use Aerial Slash for Garuda Eggy, Crimson Cyclone for Ifrit Eggy, or Earthen Armor for Titan Eggy with a maximum of two charges. So you would basically save those for every minute unless you needed to use them for movement so they became a pretty flexible tool and was after they had done a few adjustments to it a few patches later i remember eggy assault being really really well enjoyed especially when combined with eggy assault 2 uh, just to make sure that you had all of these mobility tools there were very few gcds where you were 100 grounded and you just had to make sure not to overcap on eggy assaults as well 
Uh, Resurrections? I don't know what's, what's revised about this. Uh, now only level 12. Okay. Summon 2. Uh, this is the same exact changes as Summon 1, and it is, it is still the tank pet. And then you have Fester, now acquired by Arcanist. So you, as an Arcanist at level 18, had it, which was pretty nice. And otherwise, it still had a similar effect. Still gave you Aether Trail attunement. Still had its potency buffed by Bio and Miasma. So all of those things are important. Now Ivy wants back in. Of course she does. Uh, energy, energy Drain, now I believe was what replaced Aether Flow as a whole. Yeah, so now instead of having an Aether Flow ability on Summoner, you would use Energy Drain in single target and Energy Siphon on AoE. So that would be how you generate Aether Flow 2, and then you'd get those two Fester uses or Pain Flare uses or whatever it is you were going to use. But it was a more aggressive way of using Aether Flow, and I remember it being generally liked. I remember one downside being that you didn't get MP from these actions, but that ended up being okay for most people, as I recall. Bio 2, still the same upgrade. Uh, I think it's just the damage over time being buffed because it already lasted 30 seconds in the previous expansion. Uh, you know, that was just them fixing the lower level stuff with Bio earlier. Then you have Bane, which was normalized to 60% reduced potency whenever it was spread. Also spreads the Ruination effect, which was really nice. And otherwise, uh, yeah, now also spreads a target's ruination, which was great. Uh, additional effect, Ether Trail Attunement has been removed because its Ether Gauge cost was removed as well. You could just only do it once every 10 seconds. So just completely removed from that factor and just something you would use to control AoE damage in, you know, any sort of encounter where it was applicable. Summon 3 changes are the same as Summon 1 and 2. I already told you Energy Siphon is Energy Drain, just AoE, otherwise exactly the same. Ruin 2, the effects of this action have been completely revamped, deals unaspected damage with a potency of 80. Uh, so now as you can see, this also has that same effect that Ruin 1 had, but this is still instant cast. It is still a, mo a mobility tool. So that is the primary reason you would use it. They finally renamed Tribind to Outburst. And yeah, it's just a generic AoE at this point, which Summoner had kind of a weird relationship with in the prior expansions. Eggy Assault 2, also two charges, Slipstream, Flaming Crush, or Mountain Buster for the various pets. So again, more instant cast, more things you just had to make sure you didn't over cap and more things you could use during burst windows when applicable. And Kindle, now a two minute cooldown and can only be executed while in combat, but otherwise still did those big actions for the pets. Pain Flare, same deal, just had its potency adjusted. And uh, other than that, you know, it just doesn't have Ether Trail Attunement. Uh, interesting enough, yeah, because Ether Trail Attunement, I think is gone at this point as a whole because Fester doesn't have it either. Yeah, Ether Trail Attunement has been gone. Yeah, so it's just that whole Ether Trail Attunement thing is just gone as a whole. So with Bane, uh, Ether Gauge cost being removed is something that was actually unique to it. I'd kind of slip of the tongue there, you know, trying to juggle all the summoner information that we have. Uh, Ruin 3, if the target is suffering from Bio or Miasma, you get more potency from it. Um, it no longer had the reduction for being in Dreadworm Trance because Ruin 1 now upgraded to Ruin 3. I believe we will see that in the traits. So it's just inheriting those effects and essentially gaining 20 potency for all of this. Cause that's, you know, when you go back and look at it, that's all it's really gained. Try Disaster, pretty much the same. Uh, and it also inflicts Ruination, Bio 3, Miasma 3. Um, and also, and then it just explains Ruination again and last 30 seconds, you know, this is just, it's, it is what it was before pretty much. Um, it does also affect Outburst now though. So you do want to spread Ruination with Try Disaster to make sure that your Outbursts are doing more damage in AoEs. And it also only has a 50 second recast, which would go a long way to allow me to use it way more, especially when we look at the Dreadworm Trance changes that came right after. No longer buffing magic damage, instead reducing spell casting time by two and a half seconds. It also resets the Tri Disaster Recast timer as it did before and grants two units of Dreadworm Ether. So basically, one Dreadworm Trance became one Demi Bahamut at that level. That's going to matter more when we talk about some of the later elements in Shadowbringers. But essentially, it was just you getting into those phases way quicker. And as it says at the bottom, shares a recast timer with Firebird Trance. Very important. So basically, no more big magic damage buff. And instead of just reducing Ruin 3's cast time like it did before, instead it reduces all spell casting time by two and a half seconds, of which Ruin 3 is going to be a beneficiary of. So it ends up being kind of the same. 
But then you, of course, have Death Flare. Uh, can only be executed while in Dreadworm Trance and fades upon execution. So you could do that rapid opener where you Dreadworm Trance and Death Flare immediately to get into your Summon Bahamut to get it during your buff window. And I believe that was the right way of going about things during your opener. I think you had to wait a few GCDs to do it. And again, this is where the whole super high APM heavy summoner just kind of kept chugging and chugging along. Ruin 4. Um, the effects of this action have been completely revamped. So it now is 120 potency. If the target is suffering, you know, it still gets the bonus. Can only be executed while under the effect of further ruin. So basically, I think ruin four replaces ruin two on your hotbar when you get a further ruin proc, but you get further ruin procs from using eggy assaults. And I believe they were 100%, which we'll see in the traits below. So you could essentially stock up to four ruin fours to use. They could be used for movement, they could be used for damage, and you just had to make sure you didn't overcap them or waste them, same with the Eggy Assaults, and that became a big part, as the dot elements of the job, while they're present in the way that you deal damage, thanks to, you know, the way they interact with all your ruin spells, they, um, they became much more easier to manage, so they instead introduced these other aspects to juggle with the Eggy Assaults and the Further Ruin on top of the eventual Firebird Trance. We have Devotion, again, this is just only damage now, no damage reduction, no healing, and it's just 5% to all party members nearby. Bio 3 and Miasma 3, pretty much just changing their potencies. Summon Bahamut now will only execute Warm Wave when you cast a spell on an enemy. Still, uh, Adel, um, I think spell meaning your GCDs, so like Ruin 3s, for example, and Ruin 4s, but not things like your Adels. So you weren't as, uh, as pressed for just spamming all of your abilities to get extra Worm Waves in at this point. But because it costs 2 Dreadworm Aether, and you now get 2 Dreadworm Aether from Dreadworm Trance at a high enough level, you can essentially just go right into Summon Bahamut just with a single Dreadworm trance uh, execution. So very, very uh, streamlined, which was important given what would happen at level 80. Worm Wave we just talked about and Kindle Bahamut pretty much the same as it was. Only a 10 second recast now, which, you know, again, allows you to more comfortably fit two of them inside of your 20 second summon Bahamut. And uh, yeah, 650. So it changed the potency a little bit and also changed the way that the fall off works as well as well. Then at level 72, you get Firebird Trance. So this is basically just Phoenix Dance, which it, uh, honestly just functioned very similarly to Bahamut. This was your odd minute buff window, but I believe it also was the harder hitting one for a time being. Uh, that obviously isn't the case anymore, but I remember summoners having this weird thing where their odd minute buff window was stronger than their even minute buff window, but the stronger buff windows were on the even minutes. Uh, I think I'm remembering that right, and we'll see it here in just a little bit. Uh, well, every time you can, yeah, and then Scarlet Flame works the same, reduces spell cast time, just like the other one, resets Try Disaster, changes, uh, it does, did change Ruin 3 and Outburst to Fountain of Fire and Brand of Purgatory, so it did give you some fancy new animations and a little bit of a potency buff to those spells. And uh, yeah, you had to alternate between uh, Demi Bahamut and Demi Phoenix and just had to go back and forth and back and forth pretty much throughout the entire fight. Fountain of Fire, just a flat 250 potency and it would give you a proc that made you instant cast Brand of Purgatory for 350 AoE potency. So you just go Fountain of Fire, Brand of Purgatory, Fountain of Fire, Brand of Purgatory, back and, ba back and forth until Firebird Trance was done. Then you had Enkindle Phoenix, which ordered them to execute Revelation, which was just big damage, much like Ockmorn. We go down here, it's the exact same potency as Ockmorn. You have Scarlet Flame, you have Everlasting Flight to heal people over time. And I think the big thing is, is that they didn't have that regen factor yet. So you basically just had more damage during your Firebird Trance, but I believe again that it was in your off minute buff window. So it wasn't usually during the biggest buffs that you could possibly get, which was just a little bit weird, but I think they worked that out at some point and like changed potencies around and stuff like that. I could have swore they already had the, uh, not the regen ability with Everlasting Flight, but the one that you could place on a target, but I guess that was an Endwalker exclusive thing. Just didn't remember that entirely properly. Then you have the pet actions, you have Gust, Downburst, and Glittering Emerald. Uh, this is just part of your Eggy Assault. Actually, this might be an auto attack and Downburst. Let me go, uh, let me go back and just scroll up to... Oh, you know what? Actually, we should look at the other skills because this says uh, Eggy Assault is Aerial slash Crimson Cyclone and Earthen Armor. So yeah, let's scroll past the 
basic carbuncle stuff and go up. Windblade, Aerial, Slash, Slipstream. So Windblade is your pet's auto attack. Aerial Slash is Eggy Assault 1. Slipstream is Aerial Assault 2. And it's very similar to the way it is now. As you can see, it creates that uh, Slipstream centered around the target on top of an initial potency. And then Aerial Blast is just there in Kindle. Um, they did lose Contagion altogether at this point. None of that magic damage buffing. And the Shockwave knockback skill, which I was surprised lasted up to that point. And Titan Any Freak pretty much got similar changes. You know, your pet couldn't be targeted anymore and while they had fixed the whole your pet dies to everything problem i believe even in the middle of a realm of born this was a big step back for some people depending on the content you were doing because your tank pet could no longer tank an opponent instead it was more of a support pet for the summoner themselves earthen armor creates a barrier around you that absorbs damage totaling 20 percent of your max hp i mean that was your that was one of your eggy assaults right there and then eggy assault 2 would have been mountain buster but the big thing is, is that because your pets were abilities, because they were instant, a good summoner would actually summon Titan during downtime phases and then use that shield on themselves whenever they had deemed necessary. Yes, would it mean that they wouldn't have it for when the enemy came back and they couldn't use it on damage? Sure, but especially in prog scenarios, it was really nice to have an extra shield that you can just decide whether or not you want to go out of your way to use. And most, again, skilled summoners did go out of their way to use it, especially in prog. Then for Ifrit, you know, you have a single target action, auto attack, you have an Eggy Assault, an AoE Eggy Assault, and of course, Inferno at the end of the day. Uh, now, one thing actually I'm, I realized I'm, I was forgetting about Ifrit, you know, I talked about the potency of Inferno being 300 versus the 250 potency of the Garuda pet in that of Aerial Blast. I remember that not really making sense and working out exactly the same way because the way that physical damage was calculated way back when, you know, before even Shadowbringers, and the way magical damage was calculated was handled in two completely different ways. So I think Garuda actually ended up out DPSing Ifrit, especially once they got Contagion to have that magic damage reduction as opposed to, or the magic damage buff as opposed to the, uh, you know, the, the dot extension. Um, yeah, I remember Inferno still being generally frowned upon, even though the potency was higher, just because it was considered physical damage and didn't scale as well as Garuda's stuff did, especially given Summoner's actual stats. Yeah, there's all sorts of wonky little things like that. I'm sure if I really think about it, I can figure out way more janky stuff that happened with Summoner that I've just completely skipped past because it's not immediately readable in the abilities. But I just unlocked that core memory. Figured it was worth sharing. Uh, all the pet commands, you know, this is still a way heal, play, stay, guard, steady, sick, nothing fancy there. Roll actions, you know, they had Addle, Swiftcast, Lucid, Surecast, all useful in obvious ways. We still use those today. And then we had the traits, you know, further ruin upon using Eggy Assaults up to a maximum stack of Four. So again, you could store those for quite some time. You had Enhancing Kindle, bringing it down to the two minutes. And then you had all these new ones, you know, the Dreadworm Ether, granting getting two units of Dreadworm Ether when you end a Dreadworm Trance instead of the one. Further ruin upon using Eggy Assault 2. So, you know, that's when you could really start holding the stacks for a long period of time. Ruination lasting 30 seconds, Bane Spreading Ruination, and Firebird Trance, uh, giving the Everlasting Flight, basically your uh, Phoenix having that AoE regen that's built into the pet. But yeah, Shadowbringer is, there's a lot of people who really pine for this era of Shadowbringers. It was, again, very action heavy, very hard to play optimally. But you know, that's, that's kind of a healthy thing to have in MMOs. Some jobs that are really easy and some jobs that are not. And there's a large subset of people who, despite what was regarded as a little bit of clunkiness, a little bit of uh, an, a too extended of an opener, you know, the opener just dragged on and on and on. It was something that just went way out of your buff windows in order to do it ideally. Uh, There's still a, a lot of people who really, really liked Shadowbringer's Summoner. And so when they announced they would be reworking it for Endwalker, it was, uh, it, it was met with mixed feelings. You know, it, people weren't necessarily not excited for it, but they were worried about it. Um, looking at the rest of Stormblood, just real quick. Again, I've been recording this for so long, it's hard for me to stay focused on some of the finer points that we have here. But I'm sure there's either like cooldown reductions or potency, because I remember them being largely the same. Like I see Ruin 3 eventually got brought back up to 200. Am I not? Am I? I'm not looking at... 
yeah, I'm still looking at at, at uh, Shadowbringers right here. You can see that they eventually, you know, walked back certain things. The biggest thing they walked back was the whole potency thing on Ruin. All of them just became, you know, 180, 160, 200. They got rid of that whole, oh, it's like a mini fester on everything aspect of the Ruins. I don't even think that survived one major patch, if I'm going to be completely honest with you. And, I mean, that's a precursor to just getting rid of the dots altogether, because that is what they would do in the next expansion, and that is something that a lot of people were afraid they were going to do. Uh, also, it looks like Ruination was completely done away with as well, just looking at some of these effects right here. Even just looking at Bane uh, no longer having anything to do with Ruination mentioned here. So Ruination gone, the dot management aspect of your single target skills, of your Ruin skills, all gone, uh, and then I think everything else is largely the same, other than maybe like a cooldown of some kind. But yeah, I mean, that was just a precursor to what would eventually be the changes that we got in Endwalker. And finally, we come to the end, literally in that of Endwalker Summoner. This is as of just a couple months ago, November of 2022. And I mean, people know how it is now. Pretty much all of your major abilities are given to you at the early levels, and then you gradually expand by one or two abilities all the way up. You know, Fester is just, you just use it. It costs Ether Flow now. You know, so you just, you get your energy drain at level 10, you get your fester at level 10, and so you can energy drain and fester at that level. You know, one energy drain equals two festers or two pain flares. But other than that, the summons just become these rotations that you go through between ether charges, which eventually becomes summon Bahamut, which eventually becomes summon Phoenix. And this again has been a quite a contentious thing. I know a few people who actually really love playing current summoner. They love having all these giant summons, which was the big thing that pulled us in in the trailer. You know, they've got they've got this big Garuda, big Titan, Bingy Freet. You know, you've got giant, you've got Bahamut, you've got Phoenix. You look like a summoner. But then the actual actions that you're pressing during that time are usually just like one or two actions that you're going back and forth between. And that's all it really is. I almost said was, but that's all it really is at the moment. And, uh, you know, some people, they don't mind that that's what it is, but some people kind of want it to get a little more involved. What a lot of us, myself included, are kind of hoping is that it will expand. It's, it's, it's in a place that's very expandable gameplay-wise. So we're hoping it's super simple here and that they'll at least add a couple of interesting things to it in the next expansion. But, you know, given the way job design is right now, that's, that's uh, kind of a tough thing to hope for. You know, at this point, the actual pets are gone. You have the giant summon animations, but Carbuncle literally just sits there and, and stares at you pretty much the entire time. Yeah, you use Radiant Aegis through Carbuncle as long as you don't have one of the other summons out, but like... That's it. He doesn't attack. He doesn't do anything. They even took Searing Light away from him, which was a buff. He started the expansion being able to apply. Uh, but, I mean, other than that, you just go back and forth between a few buttons, alternate between all of your summons, you know, Bahamut, you know, Garuda. What, what, what's the order? I think it's like Titan, Garuda, Ifrit, ideally, unless you need to change Ifrit around for any reason. Um, and then Phoenix, the same. Bahamut, the same. Phoenix, the same. It's just back and forth over and over and over again. So, yeah, it's, uh, it is what it is. I kind of enjoy it, but I definitely want it to be a little more involved than it is right now. Curious to see how it'll turn out in 7.0. We really have no idea how they are going to continue to add to it, evolve it, whatever they're going to do. But what I can say is at least we got what we wanted to a capacity. Summoner is definitely summoner now. Now make it more summoner, more summons, more big explosions, more effects that people set to small because they just can't see what they're doing. Our time is now. Anyway, with that, it's been a very long video, so I'm gonna wrap things up. Thank you for watching this video. Be sure to like, favorite, subscribe, and share, and stay tuned. We have all sorts of Final Fantasy related content coming up, especially in February. Keep an eye out on that. Anyway, I'll see you in the next one, and until then, take care. <laughs>